Welcome back, everybody. A lot has been going on. We got a lot to cover. If you're new, my name's Nicholas, and this is Investing Against the Grain. Do me a favor. If you like what you're going to see in a second here, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell. If you want to wait till the end before you do that, no worries. I get it. But we got a lot to cover in a short amount of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover three topics. The first topic I'm going to talk about is Tesla stock price. We're not going to spend too much time on it because, well, there's not much to talk about. Two, we're going to talk about the allegations against Elon Musk with regards to the sexual harassment uh, situation and all that. We'll touch on that. Three, we'll be talking about the newest release on Hulu uh, called Elon Musk Crash Course, which might be construed as a hit piece. So I'm going to leave some timestamps down below. If you don't want to hear about stock, if you don't want to hear about the allegations, feel free to uh, fast forward and go to where you, you know, whatever content you want to watch. All right. Okay. So with that said, let's start off by talking about the stock price. So Tesla got demolished absolutely demolished on Friday, right? And actually Friday started off looking pretty decent. I think we were up about $20 right at the open of the bell. And then it just got crushed throughout the day. In fact, I think uh, the NASDAQ was down about one and a half, maybe 2%. I forget. It's not that important. What's important is to note that Tesla was down seven to 10%, right? I think at worst in the day it was down 10% and then it kind of closed up a little bit off the lows to 7%. Either way, this is very, th something else happened here, okay? Because normally Tesla trades at a beta of two. In other words, whatever percentage down the NASDAQ is, multiply by two, that's what Tesla normally is down. And the inverse is true. Whatever it's up by, multiply by two, that's what Tesla tends to be. But this time it was different. The NASDAQ was down one and a half, two percent. So you would have thought Tesla would be down three to four percent. Instead, we were seven, ten percent. So what, what was happening, okay? Well, obviously, we know the macro environment, right? That's all been going on. But there's other stuff that's happening now that's mainly centered around Elon Musk. So, so what happened? Well, Elon Musk had this tweet recently. All right, so let's take a look at that. So here he tweeted saying, in the past, I've voted Democrat because they were mostly the kindness party, but they have become the party of division and hate. So I no longer support them and will vote Republican. Now, watch the Dirty Tricks campaign against me unfold. Popcorn emoji. All right. This is not me here to talk about Democrats or Republicans or anything of the nature. The point is, this is how Elon Musk feels. And he just vocalized it. And what he anticipated was a lot of attacks, a lot of salacious things to probably come out and just, you know, just hate against him. And I think we've seen this, okay? We, we saw it with Bill Burr when he was, you know, just ridiculed and was called a racist and all that because he had some jokes that were, or it wasn't even some jokes because he was at an award ceremony. He didn't know how to pronounce someone's name. And people start calling him racist, yet he's married to an African-American woman. So, I mean, that's a little ridiculous. And then we saw the whole Joe Rogan thing where Joe Rogan, again, got called a, a um a vaccine denier, all that stuff, because he took some some other medications, right? I don't want to say it on here, but he took something besides the vaccine. And then they called him a vaccine denier or an anti-vaxxer. And then they went on to say that, uh, that he was racist and all that. And of course, people like like Dave Chappelle came to his back and, you know, a lot, a lot of other prominent black celebrities and people who are important in that culture came to Joe Rogan's back and essentially kind of smoothed things over and put a kibosh on this whole narrative that Joe was a racist. So, and then we see now with Elon, okay? So this is just the latest, you know, the latest thing that we see. And this doesn't mean, I'm not, again, this to me, forget Democrat, Republican, okay? Forget that part of it. I'm just talking about in general attacks against people and trying to, to paint a certain picture of them in a way that isn't true or representat representative of who they are. Bill Burr, is not a racist. He's not a sexist. All right. Like, come on. Like, this is ridiculous. He's again, he's married to a black woman like that. Like to say he's racist is just you're leaving. You're living in your own echo chamber in your own thought. And you just believe whatever people think to say Joe Rogan is racist. Again, that's ridiculous to say he's anti-vax. That's ridiculous as well. OK, I mean, he, he's said so many times he just doesn't think it's right for him. Right. And he's got other vaccines. It's not like he's never had a vaccine. So it's Right. Context and nuance seems to be just missing when people have these arguments or debates and people don't call them out on it. And I think that's where kind of Elon Musk comes into all of this.
So this leads into Elon now. And the same thing's happening, okay? You, you see people attacking Elon, right? We have narratives like, oh, Elon and Tesla and his companies are racist. Uh, they're homophobic. You see things about anti-gay, all these things that that is just not true, okay? Or they, they don't like diversity on their teams. They don't like to have women in their company. Again, none of this is true, but you, you take one anecdote from one thing and you extrapolate that out and that becomes the rule. Right. It's it's as if someone said Tesla is a bad investment because look what's done in 2022. And they just show you a graph of 2022. Yet they forego the last five years. Right. It, it's you. If you look through this lens. OK, sure. It looks really bad. But when you look at the bigger lens, you see, oh, OK, this is a blimp in the radar compared to what Tesla's done the last five years. So context and nuance matters and the way people spin things can can lead you to look and see things in a certain way. So anyways, with this tweet, Elon would no doubtedly upset a lot of people, all right? Especially a lot of Tesla loyalists who are very democratic. You know, it, it makes sense. Okay, I get people being upset. But again, you don't have to agree with everything that Elon thinks. And if you do, then you're just a sheep, okay? You can respect Elon and respect Tesla and respect all that they do, but not have to agree with every little thing about them. And I think even they would say you shouldn't agree with everything they think either. And that's the biggest problem we have in this country, that people either identify left or right, and they feel like, well, if I'm a Democrat, I have to believe everything Democrats think. And if I'm a Republican, I have to think everything Republicans think. And if I'm Libertarian, I have to think everything Libertarians think. When that's not how we work as humans, okay? So anyways, so, so Elon tweeted this, and this obviously you know, had a stir. A lot of people said things that night. Less than 24 hours later, all of a sudden, we get this new business insider news story about these sexual allegations about Elon Musk on, on a SpaceX flight with a flight attendant. Now, to be clear, some things that I feel like have kind of been lost in a lot of the things I've heard. The individual who supposedly was, and I say supposedly because it's alleged, okay, there's no actual ruling or anything that said this happened. So the alleged victim did not say anything. The alleged victim has not come up. In fact, the alleged victim did not give permission to the friend. And I put quotes a friend because, well, I'll get into that in a second, but because the friend uh, never asked the individual or the alleged victim if they could speak out on their behalf or if they could, you know, come out with this story. And so my opinion is a true friend wouldn't just do this on their own accord and not ask me. So the friend, their argument was that they think that being silent on a matter like this would just further hurt other people who have been sexually assaulted or have been through certain things, which, you know, on the surface, you hear something like this and you think, yes, if something did happen, then I get wanting to speak up. But then there's a lot of gray here, okay? And, and the first gray is, if you're a real friend, it is not up to you to decide what's right for me. It's not up to you, to you to decide or to go on and tell my story. And it's really not up to you to decide what is right and what's not right, okay? Uh, obviously, this individual either settled in some way or something happened, which we don't know. And, and that should be left to that individual to make a decision. All right. It's their truth. It's their story. And there can be a lot of loss of translation. But the other part that's, you know, it, it see, makes this all seem disingenuous. And it seems like the, again, friend is hiding behind this, this cloak of, well, I'm doing it for all, you know, victims out there. Is that if that was the truth and you really did have this benevolent agenda, then why did you wait so long? I mean, this wasn't a year. This wasn't two years. This wasn't six years. I think it was eight years total. And It'd be one thing if it was the the victim or the alleged victim who took that amount of time, because as an individual, I can only, I can't even imagine, right? But the trauma that might set upon you, and you know, it's not something you're ready to come out, and maybe you decide you don't want to, and maybe you know, a decade later you decide I want to speak up about this. As a victim, I think that's more than understandable, right? To a degree that we couldn't even understand unless we've been in that situation ourselves. But for this friend and this again, friend, to come out and spend that much time before they thought it was the right time to do something. I don't know. There's just something that feels weird about this and the timing of all this. All right. Again, the timing of this with Elon coming out saying that he's not voting Democrat. Like, it's just there's something weird about all of this. 
And the fact that Business Insider went ahead and put this out there, there, something doesn't smell right about this. Okay, I'm not saying there's nothing here. I'm not saying that you know it didn't happen. I'm not saying it did happen. All I'm saying is this seems like a hit piece. It seems like something to come after Elon. And it seems like something that they, that so, some entity out there has been trying to do to many of these people who are speaking out against certain things like free free speech. Uh, people talking about you know having the choice to be vaccinated or not vaccinated. I mean, like, you see a lot of this stuff happening again. Bill Burr. Uh, you, you see it with Dave Chappelle, right? Even Dave Chappelle got attacked um, for saying things he didn't actually say. Uh, Joe Rogan, now Elon Musk. I mean, it's this this whole idea of attacking people and their character because we're going to look at one little window of something they said, take it out of context. This whole thing, we don't know what happened. We don't know uh, if something did or didn't happen. And it's not for us to judge it. It's for the, 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 the parties affected to make their decisions on how they go about what they what happened. And I think to just put out stories that have half truths and a friend of a friend and hearsay stories. I mean, that is just uh, defamation, right, of character. I think that's all it is. And I think that was the intent behind this. So again, I don't want to give this too much, uh, too much time or too much energy. But I think it's important to, to understand the context here and understand that we do have a certain process in this country where you're innocent until proven guilty. And I think there's always two sides to every story. And I don't think this friend, this, this actress in LA, I don't think her side of the story matters. I don't think she's the one that should be telling it. I don't think she has all the details. She heard what somebody else said, maybe. And she didn't even get their permission to talk about this. So to me, that's not a good friend. It's a little disingenuous and it's not right for any publication to to report on one side without getting more detail. I get it. We're in an era of clickbait and getting things out as fast as possible without maybe getting more context or nuance about things or doing real reporting. But I don't think that there's any excuse for that, especially whenever there's potentially defamation of character or defamation of brand or of a company that's trying to do good. And that leads me into the next thing. Tesla and Elon Musk are sick of this. They're tired of being attacked for, for things that may or may not be true or things that are just taken out of context to the point where they are ready to take action. Take a look at this. So Elon Musk tweeted, Tesla is building a hardcore litigation department where we directly initiate and execute lawsuits. The team will report directly to me. Please send three to five bullet points describing evidence of exceptional ability. So this to me tells me that Tesla is about to have the best legal team out of any company out there, all right? Now, why would Tesla be doing this? What would be the reason behind it? Well, there's a couple reasons, but let's first continue on with Elon's thread because he started to tweet more after this. So he went on to say, my commitment, we will never seek victory in a just case against us, even if we probably will win. So in other words, if Tesla was in the wrong, even if they believe they can win, even if they believe they can win, but they're in the wrong, they will not seek to win because doing the right thing matters more than the perception of doing the right thing. All right. We've heard Elon say that a lot lately. So then it goes on to say, we will never surrender or settle an unjust case against us, even if we will probably lose. In other words, even if we won't win, but we are in the right and we know we're in the right, we will continue until it's over, even if it means losing. Because again, fighting for what's right is what matters. He goes on to finally say, please include links to cases you have tried. Looking for hardcore street fighters, not white shoe lawyers like Perkins or Cooley, who thrive on corruption. There will be blood. So hearing that, I think Tesla is set to turn a new page. Right, the the days of Tesla and Elon being benevolent and kind and and assuming that other people are going to use their patents or treat them in a nice way and benevolent way and assuming good intention, I think those days might be gone or behind them. And the reason is because now it's costing Tesla. It's hurting Tesla. Right? It's hurting the brand. It's hurting the reputation because all these companies, these media companies, are out there spreading fud without any recourse, okay? Tesla doesn't go after people. Tesla doesn't sue people. But now things are changing. Now it's 
it's potentially impacting the brand and the company, and that means potentially impacting lives, and which means also pot potentially slowing down the mission of the company, which is to accelerate the advent of sustainable energy. So what's the best way to go about this? Well, go ahead, trash Tesla, talk, talk lies about Tesla and see what happens. It's gonna take one time, one time for a company to go bankrupt because Tesla came after them. It's gonna take one time for someone to get sued and get taken to cleaners before other companies, other news media start to say, okay, hold on, before you post anything, are we gonna get in trouble for this? And this is gonna force people to be real reporters and not just clickbait reporters. This is important because what have we seen in the last, few, in the last couple of days? Well, we saw Business Insider come out with this article with this flight attendant's friend. All right, so there's that part of it. Then we also saw ESG come out with their claims about why Tesla is somehow, um, well, so the ESG, right? Environmental Social Governance. The uh, Tesla was kicked out of the five hundred index SP five hundred index for ESG companies, and who went on? Oil companies went in, right? So you have oil companies in there. You have you have other legacy OEMs for automakers in there. Yet Tesla's booted out, and the reasons they cited was uh, they have no plans with regards to carbon neutrality. Yet they are carbon neutral. They talked about um, having bad working conditions, talk about having a, a racist environment, right? All these things that just are fundamentally untrue, right? And, and they're, again, snitpicking little, little things and making that the rule and the truth. And then you put that out there. And again, that hurts the brand. So again, you have Business Insider doing their thing. You have, um, you have ESG doing their thing. Um, you, have, you have that CNN with the guy who uh, did the testing of the FSD beta. I've talked about that, right? Just the coverage of that, again, it was just bad. It wasn't good. And then you have this new, this new, what do you call it? A documentary, a hit piece, um, a, a biased point of view when it comes to Tesla that came out on Hulu. And again, this is yet another biased piece of information that is very misleading, very out of context. And I'll talk about that in a second, but to wrap up this, this law team that Tesla is putting together, I think a lot of it's going to be to fight that, to fight the BS that's coming out from these companies that are just trying to get clickbaits and just trying to get things with Elon Musk's face on there because they, they know they can get eyes and attention there and it's going to draw, it's going to make them money. It, it's the truth of it, it, right? You put Elon, you put Tesla, money's made. It, it's the way it works. So I think this will be a big deal. And they saw this work in China. People were putting out fake things about a Tesla crash. And it turns out, you know, it wasn't actually Tesla's fault and people lied about brakes not working, things of that nature. And the, the Tesla China team went after them. They were, they were charged fines. They had to make public apologies, right? So in China, they took care of this very well. You know, for, for, uh, for a lot of people, they think China is bad and all that. But, you know, they also don't, they don't deal with this kind of BS as, as easily as we do here in the States. So I think they've seen good reaction from that. And so I think they're also going to start taking that action here. Now, again, I don't think this is a Elon Musk defense team. I think Elon's going to sit there and believe, say whatever you want about me. I don't care what you say about me, but don't mess with Tesla. Don't mess with SpaceX. All right. You cannot, you cannot mess with them because if you mess with them, you hurt our goals of reaching a sustainable planet and you hurt our goals of getting to full autonomy and you hurt our brand and you hurt just our reputation, which is here just to do good. All right. And again, if it's something that is, you know, worthy of suing us for, as Elon said, we will not try to win that even if we think we can. Now, the other reason I think this team is being assembled is just yet another step towards full self-driving, another step towards autonomy, because you better believe as this rolls out, as robo taxis come to the market, you're going to have people claiming, oh no, the robo taxi hit me or, oh, it did this out of nowhere. And they're going to need a good defense team for this. So I think this is also part of that. It's just another arm for that. So let's go ahead and pivot and talk about this. Again, I don't know what to call it. It's labeled as Elon Musk crash course on Hulu, which again, it's it's them trying to be witty, crash course, right? Like, what are they doing here, All right? So you immediately get the the understanding of how biased this is going to be. So, so, so how does this start? So when you watch it, it's about an hour long, and it starts off with with a crash. Okay, you can see that there's debris everywhere. 
you see a, a Tesla just essentially in, you know, just shredded apart. You hear a uh, 911 call and all this stuff. And it's just, it's, it seems so dramatic, right? They're building it up. And this is how it's starting, right? There's no context. There's no build up. There's no trying to be, you know, transparent about anything. That's how it starts. So then they cut away and they start showing, you know, clips of FSD beta. All right. And now they don't call it at no point do they call FSD beta. They, they talk about FSD. They talk about autopilot. They talk about how Tesla and Elon advertise that it's autonomous and all this, which again, all false, all lies. You have never heard Elon say the cars can drive themselves, that they're ready. You, you hear Elon saying in the future, they'll be able to do X, Y, Z. You hear him saying, yeah, maybe in two years, maybe in three years, maybe in a year, maybe next year. You never hear him say, yes, it can do it. It can do all of this, right? But that's not what they say in the documentary. But so then they cut right into these FSD beta testers, which again, I, I'm very curious if anyone gave them permission for this footage because I don't think a lot of them did. For example, Rob Mauer, they cut to Rob Mauer. If you recall, when Rob Mauer, host of Tesla Daily, um, he got FSD beta, he finally got it. And he went ahead to, he went for this first time to use it, to test it out. And he started in this parking lot. I think it was at a convention center. Um, uh, my memory, I've only seen it once. So, so don't, you know, <laughs> don't uh, assault me if I'm wrong about this. But I believe he was at a convention center and he was, he went to start it. And before he even started it, he acknowledged, I'm in a parking lot. This isn't ready for parking lots, but let's just see what it does. So he starts in a parking lot and he goes and he's sitting there, whoa, whoa. And you know, this is his first time. He's not used to it. And that's all they show in the video or in this, uh, in this, uh, this, this hit piece, I'm going to call it, uh, for, for Tesla. And they only show him going, whoa, 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 as if it was about to crash. What they don't show everybody is that, again, they don't talk about it's Rob Mauer's first time that he's not used to it. They also don't talk about how, yes, it made a weird maneuver in a parking lot that it's not meant for. So Rob was technically doing something he wasn't supposed to, right, by using it in that space. But it's also beta. They don't mention that. And then finally, they don't mention that even though it's not supposed to be used for there, it's Rob's first time, it's in beta, it got out just fine without any intervention. They never talk about that, not once, right? So right away, you, you get the impression of which way this documentary, this hit piece is going. Right? It's obviously already going to be biased against Tesla, and if, if it wasn't obvious enough already from the title. Then they proceed to show just more clips of, of you know, autopilot and things of that nature. They show somebody driving, falling with just asleep. Right, Someone is recording with their phone of another individual in their Tesla just asleep at the wheel, but the car is driving fine, which, which right out the gate, at what point do you sit there and say, oh, this is Tesla's fault? Like, how does everybody just ignore the individual? This is what blows my mind. Now, I, I, I have a background, a Navy background, okay? I've, I've never actually talked about that on this channel, but my, I have a Navy background, and maybe it's a military thing. But when you're in the military, something they teach you is to take ownership for your mistakes. It's not Jim's fault. It's not Jessica's fault. I messed up. I have to own it. I call it out. I iterate. I get better. And, and we move on, right? There's, you take ownership for things, even if it's not your, your mistake, right? If I see, I, I, I do this all the time. If I see a piece of trash outside, well, I see it, I own it. I pick it up, I throw it away, right? I, I do it all the time. But there's something wrong with society right now where we want to push fault onto others. So again, that individual sleeping in that car, like you should see them and think, thank God they're in a Tesla. Because that Tesla didn't crash into anything, it's driving perfectly fine down the highway, even though that individual's asleep. That individual should be arrested. They fell asleep. They're driving asleep, right? Maybe they're drunk. Who knows? But, but to blame Tesla for that, I think that's inappropriate. Now, can you, can you argue, okay, Tesla needs to have better ways to make sure that that doesn't happen? Sure. Sure. I, I'm fine with that. I'm all about that. But you cannot put the blame on the vehicle. You can't put the blame on Tesla. It's the individual. There are rules when you use these products. It's very clear. It's very blatant. This individual decided to not follow the rules. Easy as that. All right. I don't sue a seatbelt company because somebody doesn't put their seatbelt on in the car. Right. Like that, that, that makes no sense. So why would you do it here? So then, you know, it goes on and like, keep in mind this entire 
um, hit piece documentary. Again, I'm just going to keep saying both because I don't know what to call it. It's centered around really this one accident that, that's happening, right? So they're, they're constantly during this, they're giving us glimpses of it, right? Like I said, to start off with the crash, they're giving us glimpses, they're giving us things, but they haven't told us who it is, or what it is, or anything of that nature. And in a second, you're going to understand why I mentioned that, you know, I, I do have a Navy background. But so so as we're going, like all of a sudden, they, they come about LIDAR, right? <laughs> Here we go. And they're talking about how, oh, well, Tesla realized that LIDAR is very expensive. And so they wanted to go and take an approach that didn't require LIDAR because it was expensive. And so Elon Musk decided, okay, well, we're going to make this sound cool then or sounded like it's a good idea not to use LIDAR because it's expensive. And, and so essentially they like clipped to Elon saying, oh, it's a crutch and all this stuff and trying to make it sound like, well, because Elon couldn't afford it or they couldn't afford it within the cars, that's why they chose not to use LIDAR, and that's the decision. So then they want to just go ahead and have essentially this, uh, this they want to create this narrative that LIDAR is a waste and not needed, right? Meanwhile, that is that just shows you how little they understand about the technology and how Elon and Tesla work. Look, even, even if I hated Elon, even if I didn't like Tesla, right? It's still very obvious that LIDAR is not the right approach. It's very clear, right? LIDAR, for those of you who don't know, essentially sends out beams of light. They refract, they come back, and that's how, that's how the, the vehicles like Waymo and Cruise understand what certain objects are. The problem is it's a very blunt instrument. So instead of really understanding all the nuance that we have in life, right? It, it's, it's very kind of blocky is the best way to think about it, right? It's more like seeing shapes and, and things of that nature rather than nuance, all right? Whereas what Tesla does, it's very passive, right? Passive, in other words, means it doesn't send anything out. They're just using cameras. And using those cameras, well, guess what? It's like our eyes. I can notice all detail about everything, right? I can, with the cameras, I can notice, oh, that's not just a human, that's a human holding a baby with uh, bags of groceries in the other hand, and she looks upset, and she's tapping her foot, and she's about to cross the street. Uh, you know, with cameras, I can tell, oh, what does this sign say? I can read the sign, right? There's a lot of nuance that comes from camera. The problem is, up to this point, we haven't been very good with technology and software to be able to understand what we see with cameras, Right, so that has to be invented, that technology. And so this is why everybody else leans on LIDAR because it's easier to use that versus having something, having to create a software that determines what it's seen around the world. Right, it's very hard. It's a very difficult problem to solve. But Tesla's solving it. They're doing it. It's happening. And this is something that people miss. So, so, so just in general, just with that understanding, right, it's a very bad idea to use LIDAR in, in the big scheme of things versus cameras and using, using passive versus uh, something like LIDAR that's reliant on sending out lights, uh, beams of light everywhere. And it's, it's, not great in, in bad we- it's not great in bad weather, if it's raining, if it's snowing, things of that nature, right? So it has those problems as well. But that's when people go on to say, oh, well, then that's why we have radar. Oh, okay, well, in this documentary hit piece they also bash on tesla for removing radar now what's interesting is they do cut to james dalma saying it's going to get better because of this right you, you, which is interesting they don't mention who james dalma is they just clip to him this guy with long gray hair and a ponytail and you know people watching this who don't understand who this is might think oh who's this guy long gray ponytail like why would i why would i believe him meanwhile they have no idea what his background is and how how knowledgeable he is when it comes to AI and neural nets and everything. Little do they know, right? If they gave that type of context about who he was, and this is why nuance matters, this is nuance, right? Cameras, LIDAR, same kind of idea, right? If, if they could have explained who James Dalmo was, your perception just watching that clip changes because now you realize, oh, this individual is actually an expert on the matter. Whereas the people making this documentary hit piece, what do they know? right? What do they know about this? They don't. They don't know anything about it. So anyways, so they go on to essentially trash the fact that Tesla's not using radar, which as we all know, right, Tesla has solved this problem using neural nets, right? They made a special neural net uh, subset that essentially replaces radar, but they used radar to train the neural nets, 
right? That's the point. Tesla's doing amazing things. So, so then they start going into these different engineers that used to work at Tesla. Now, the first thing I noticed right away is that, you know, they, they show their name and then the years they worked at Tesla. And what we saw was really two engineers. Uh, one worked from 2014 to 2015. The other one worked from 2015 to 2016. So, so the question becomes, what do they really know about Tesla? What do they really know about where autopilot, full self-driving, all that is? They, they don't. They, they really don't. They worked at the company for one year, right? You, sh you probably know this as well. Anytime you start working at any company, for the first month or two, you're just trying to get comfortable and get your feet wet. Like, you don't know what's really going on. And the fact that, and, and by the time they're ready to leave, right, there's another month there where you're probably not really paying attention. You're probably already a foot out the door. So really, they maybe had eight months working there, uh, nine months. I mean, the point is, it's not a lot of time. It was a year. And again, 2014, 2015, right? So that's right now we're 2022. So seven years removed. And the other one, 2015, 2016, six years removed. And they're trying to sit there and talk about where things are at as if they're experts on it. Now, doesn't mean they don't know anything and they were there and they experienced the culture of the team at that time. That's fair. But to have any real understanding or, or idea of what's going on internally within that team, I think it's a little disingenuous in the way everything was structured and the people they choose to speak on this. This is where we, we move on into the documentary hit piece where they start talking about Elon Musk and how, you know, Elon time, right? We've all heard this. And again, sprinkling through all of this, they're slowly telling us more and more about this accident that happened, right? At this point, we know that this Tesla ran into a semi truck and it, it killed the victim, right? Again, we're hearing 911 calls, all this, right? So they're slowly building up to this until we learn about what actually happened or at least their interpretation of what happened. And so they move on to talk about Elon and where he thinks things are with full self-driving. And they start early back in 2014, I believe. And they say, oh, he says, yeah, in about two years, you should be able to, you know, drive on the highway and get off on any exit without having to intervene. And, you know, we, we've all seen this, right? Two years and three years next year, I think will be better, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And we've even seen this year where Elon, you know, has said it's, you know, by the end of this year, we'll be better than human. And so they're using that to sit there and say that Elon is constantly changing his mind up and down, up and down when he thinks it'll be ready. But like you're at, like, they're acting like it's his fault for not knowing the date that the hardest problem that we've ever tried to solve will be accomplished. Like, just think about that. He, why would you cast judgment on him? Like, if you don't like the answers he's giving, then be mad at the reporters for asking, right? At least he's making an educated guess, right? He's giving us something. And, and they act like, oh, this is him marketing this stuff out there. Look, how is that Elon marketing anything to do with full self-driving about when it'll be ready? He, it's not like he stages the reporters that, hey, ask me these questions and I'll answer the way so to get people excited. Like, this is just very convoluted way of thinking. But again, He's given his best guess of when he thinks based on what he sees. And Elon talks about it all the time. He talks about how the rate of progress is constantly changing because you think you're doing really well and you're, you're, you're getting better and better and better. And then all of a sudden it becomes kind of a logarithmic curve. In other words, yeah, slight improvements, but nothing meaningful, right? So you essentially hit this local maxima, right? And you can't get out of that until you iterate and you find new ways of doing things. And then, okay, all of a sudden you start seeing acceleration again and you're, oh, you're improving, improving. Then you hit this, this next level of, of progress. And okay, now we're stuck here, right? And then we get to another one. Okay, here we go. And this keeps happening. You don't know when it's going to happen that you're going to be there. And so based on what he sees and what they're doing and the improvements they're getting, yeah, this is where he makes his estimates. You don't know, all right, like you're making your best assumption based on what the information, the rate of improvement you're getting. And that's all he's doing. Now, with that said, let me take a time out right now from talking about this, this documentary hit piece. I've been watching all of the 12.2.1 videos that have been released. All right, we, uh, we've seen, I think there's been about four or five released. And wow, absolutely wow. I think th this was a huge step change. Okay, I, I th it is so confident. It's so, so confident. You're not seeing the vehicle um, uh, hesitate as much. If you guys remember my, my video I did, uh, or my interview I did with Farzad, 
Farzad has been saying that like the problem he's having right now with FSD beta, it's not the the um, the decision of what the vehicle does, right? The turning pad or anything of that that. It's the vehicle having confidence to do it, right? It's doing the right thing. And so all he's doing, he's not intervening, right? All or he's not, you know, disengaging. The only thing he's doing now is intervening with with the accelerator. So if the vehicle's starting to go, but it's like the vehicle's not so confident because it's still scared, it's like a 16 year old behind the driving, you know, the steering wheel, like, uh, do, uh, am I good? I think I'm good. I'm not really sure. And all he's doing is putting a little pressure on the accelerator to say, yeah, go ahead and go. And so that, right, that is what this version looks like it solves, right? The vehicle is confident. It's making the right moves. It's not making this hesitant, right? It's either go or don't go. And I think this is going to be a big deal. We'll, we'll really know when Chuck Cook does his unprotected left-hand turn. I have a feeling. I have a feeling that this is going to be a big improvement for his unprotected left-hand turn. And rumor has it that that Chuck Cook um, or that Tesla was out there actually testing out on that turn just to get better details and more improvements to iterate on this. So that's interesting that they're out there testing that out. So. I cannot wait to see Chuck Cook uh, come out and do this test. I think this can be a big deal. All right, let's get back to this interview or this documentary hit piece. So at this point, they're they're about to get to what this main crash has been that you know it's kind of been sprinkled in throughout the whole documentary, and you know they they've talked about um, people driving and playing video games and watching movies and all this stuff and essentially blaming Tesla for this, right? Saying. So on one hand, they're saying that it's not good technology, right? It doesn't work well. It doesn't do all this on its own. Yeah, on the other hand, they're saying that it's giving people this false confidence that they can do these other things because it's working so well, right? Like talk about like speaking on both sides of your mouth on that one. And so then then the whole narrative becomes, well, it's, it's the onus is on Tesla to make sure people are paying attention where... I agree to that in a, to an extent, but at the end of the day, the onus is on the individual. Anyways, we'll get more to that in a second. At this point, they essentially reveal um, what happened. So this individual, um, Josh, he was driving this Tesla. And, you know, at this point, they've given background who Josh was. And, you know, he was an EOD. So essentially um, in the Navy, EODs are, are the people. If you've ever watched Jarhead, um, EODs are the ones that go and essentially um, take potential landmines or bombs and, you know, neutralize them. So that's what an EOD does in the Navy. And so Josh was essentially a, a thrill seeker and an adventure guy, always outdoors, uh, seemed like a great guy, seemed like the type of guy you'd want to go grab beer with or a nice glass of bourbon. Uh, you know, he liked to swim, liked to hike, liked to skydive, bungee jump. I mean, just, just your, 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 your normal type of adventure guy, all right? And, and Josh was also a very big tech enthusiast, right? Apparently, he was always on the cutting edge of technology, just absolutely loved it. And so, obviously, he got a Tesla, and obviously, he geeked out on autopilot. Well, then, obviously, they start to conflate all of these stories and this narrative and all that, and they have, you know, certain friends and everything there, and, you know, they're painting a very solemn picture, and it is sad, right? Like, I mean, come on, a person's life was lost, you know? So, so what happened was he was driving... Um, and he was on autopilot, presumably. And the semi cut across when it wasn't supposed to cut across from, so, so from, I guess it was on one side of the highway onto the other side of the highway. And it was cutting across and the Tesla ran right into it. And, you know, essentially sheared off the top of the vehicle and, and he passed away. So, you know, very tragic, very sad. I mean, man, you know, so much empathy towards, you know, their family. Uh, you guys know how I feel about car accidents, something I'm very passionate about. Uh, it's just, you know, every time you drive out there, it's just, it's, it's a gamble. And especially as you get older and you start really, I think as you get older, you start to appreciate life more and understand how, how valuable it is. I, I used to always hear people tell me, oh, when you're young, you think you're invincible. And I don't think I ever thought I was invincible, but I think as you get older, you just, you take life less for granted. And so when I drive now, I just see all these people doing stupid things and making these stupid maneuvers. And it's like, for what, man? For what? To get to that light two seconds earlier? You know, to, to look cool? To, to what? Like, what? where is the risk worth or, or the potential of causing death worth you making those kind of maneuvers? It's not. 
So I take this very seriously. And it's very tragic what happened to Josh. But you have to put things into perspective. Okay. And, you know, we're watching this documentary and just the way they're painting everything and how they're making Tesla and Elon just look like, you know, they're gambling with everybody else's lives with what they're doing. You, uh, you know, my fiance turned to me and she said, essentially, you know, this guy who loved Tesla, loved his autopilot, probably would not like the way his name is being used to essentially scrutinize and talk bad and bash this company and Elon. And, you know, at first, like she said to me, I'm like, yeah, he probably wouldn't. But then, you know, as the documentary was going on, I was kind of thinking, you know, but people change. Like when you have a death in a family, you, you kind of get jaded, right? You kind of feel, you, you feel some, I mean, you see it all the time, like people who are religious end up hating, you know, saying hateful stuff to God or, you know, people just can't forgive. And th there becomes this animosity and this hate towards the thing that, that took away the individual that, that you love so much. But what was interesting was then they in, in credit to the docu to this documentary slash hit piece for even mentioning this, but they mentioned a tweet that Josh had had put out, I think a year prior, where he showed a video clip of another truck coming over into his lane, like a bigger truck, and because he was on autopilot, it swerved out of the way, and Josh said that this probably saved his life. This was essentially a year prior. He tweeted that Elon Musk replied to it and retweeted it. So obviously Josh believed in this, right? He believed in this technology, right? So he was definitely an enthusiast. So then they cut back into talking about Tesla and Elon Musk. And they go ahead and talk about how the autopilot team was all, they were all pulled off to work on this one video, right? This one video that I guess is supposed to be like a commercial for autopilot. And, you know, based on what they were saying is like, it wasn't great. Uh, it ran into a fence and, you know, they took like eight different takes or nine different or however many takes before they had a good, you know, incident free uh, route. And then that's the video they put out. Now, there's two sides to every story. If Tesla actually did that with the idea of, you know, running this until it was good without, you know, making any tweaks or anything to try to iterate, like if it wasn't for those intentions, but they were trying to just fool the general public, then that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. But again, I don't believe in making opinions without hearing both sides of the story. So we don't know. And again, we're hearing from people who left the company. So, so it, it's hard to say. And, and even then, we're talking about the company back then versus now, right? I mean, things are very different. And in the documentary, they really don't talk about that at all. Then they cut over to the NHTSA investigation. So during all this, obviously, there's an accident. NHTSA opens up an investigation. And they say many different things. Oh, Elon was pissed that there's investigations open. He was yelling at us, whatever. Oh, yeah, okay, like, of course he is, right? I mean, he feels like he's being targeted. I mean, it's, I think that's a human reaction. But, but so NHTSA ends up coming out, finding that Tesla was not at fault with this, that there's no recall or anything. And it's interesting because the people seem pissed about it, right? They seem pissed about the fact that, oh, well, there's obviously something wrong with the technology if it didn't detect the truck. But that's not... Like, that makes no sense when you really think about it, right, if you unpack that. So autopilot is meant to be used with human pay, humans paying attention, right? It's an assistant tool, right? It's not a fully autonomous vehicle. Elon says that nauseam. Tesla says that nauseam. All of the indications or warnings are explained it very bluntly to you. It's not... It's not like it's it's maxed behind all this legal jargon, right? It's very simple to understand. But the point is that it's meant to assist. It's not meant to be the driver. And so what people were upset about is they're saying like, well, this is clearly a flaw in the technology because it can't stop you from doing this. But at the same time, if that's the case and you're going to recall Tesla for autopilot not being able to stop because a truck is going in front of it, right, then Every other vehicle manufacturer in the world, all their vehicles should be recalled because their vehicles can't do that. You get what I'm saying? Right? So just because the technology can't do something yet doesn't mean that recalls a recall or requires a recall. So I don't know. They seem a little upset about that, but it's common sense, right? So, so that's a debate that's going to probably continue for, for years to come, right? On whether or not it's a recall or not. I mean, we, we see this all the time, but but we're not going to get lost in that. So they're upset about that. And so this is where things kind of get interesting in this documentary and hit piece for me is that, so again, 
Josh, the way they painted Josh was like, you know, he, he was this, this great guy. He probably was, right? I mean, he was a Navy guy. Uh, you know, he was an adventurous, all that, big Tesla enthusiast. But the whole time they're talking about his accident, his crash. And the way they, they show this is as if, as if his family was in support of all this, as if his family wanted this out there, and as if they had a, a, an axe to grind with Tesla and Elon. But that wasn't the case, which was very interesting. Instead, his family wrote the following that was read out loud. His family, after Josh passed away, wrote, Joshua believed, and our family continues to believe, that the new technology going into cars and the move to autonomous driving has already saved many lives. Something you haven't heard at all in an entire hit piece documentary. Change always comes with risk and zero tolerance for deaths would totally stop innovation and improvements. Nobody wants tragedy to touch their family, but expecting to identify all limitations of an emerging technology and expecting perfection is not feasible either. Part of Joshua's legacy is that the accident drove additional improvements, making the new technology even safer. Our family takes solace and pride in the fact that our son is making such a positive impact on future highway safety. This is from the family. They are not jaded. They do not blame Tesla. They do not blame Elon Musk. Yet this whole, this whole video on Hulu, this whole hit piece, this whole documentary is centered around Josh and his accident, right? This amazing American Navy individual, EOD, just badass of an individual. And then this comes out, right? And what was even more interesting is at the very end of this entire video documentary, again, whatever you want to call it, they say that Joshua's family had no part and did not want to participate in this at all. So that just makes you wonder, if that's the case, then why are you making him the center of all of this? Right, because they clearly don't see things the way you see them. But again, clicks and likes and all that. And some people might say, well, what Tesla's doing is dangerous, so they're doing this to get out in front of it, because then they go on to show yet another death that happened very similar. And again, this is where things kind of get taken out of context, right? Uh, before they talked about that second accident that looked very similar to what happened with Josh, somebody asked him, a reporter asked him, so do you think? the fixes you guys have made would have prevented Josh's accident. And Elon is careful with his words. And he says, there's no way to tell if that's the case or not. But I think the improvements that we've made, you know, will help with a situation like that, right? He doesn't say yes. He doesn't say, yep, this won't happen again. And of course it happens again. Another individual essentially goes right under a truck and same thing, right? The entire top gets sheared off. Again, somebody's not paying attention. And I think this individual was actually on their phone or watching a movie or something. But it doesn't matter. Even if they weren't, even if they, if it's just an accident that happened, they weren't paying attention. And the onus is on them to pay attention, right? I mean, this, this is a warning to everybody out there. With anything, any autonomous vehicle, anything you're using, forget Tesla, whether it's, it's Ford, whether it's GM, whether it's Waymo, anything. Obviously, Tesla, if you're using it, you have to pay attention. We don't have autonomous vehicles yet. It's not here yet. It's close for Tesla. It's damn close with 12.2, in my opinion. But we're not there. You still have to pay attention. Don't be stupid, okay? Because every time you're stupid and you don't pay attention and something like this happens, you are potentially costing other people's lives, right? People in the future, people who, as this technology slows down, you are potentially causing their lives or injuries or putting people in ruin financially because of an injury of an accident, right? It's, it's, a, it's a whole ripple effect. So the, the last thing that really kind of grinded my gears when I was watching this was the fact that you, it was about halfway through the whole documentary hit piece that I started to notice they were taking clips of interviews that Elon had between late 2021 and 2022, even with Lex Friedman that he had in 2022 in January, I believe. And they were taking the words he said that, the words he was saying in those interviews with regards to FSD beta, I guess at that point, it would be, uh, you know, 10.1 or, or 9. Dot something. But, they're, but he's referring to FSD beta and they're taking his words and then they're immediately going and talking about 
these crashes and stuff that happened back in 2016 or 2017 or 2018. Right, and fundamentally, two different things: autopilot versus FSD, and they're using that. And it's just—it's very disingenuous. They don't sit there and they don't put a date for when these interviews were, and they go right into the, those uh, crashes in those years. So that, to me, that is a perfect use case for Tesla to use this new law team that they're assembling to go after. That was disingenuous. That is slander or or libel. I'm not really sure which one is which, but the point is it's defamation of character. It's defamation of the company. So essentially, the whole thing wraps up ending uh, talking about or showing clips of Omar Kazi and Gali, um, them in uh, FSD beta and showing it almost hitting a, a bicyclist where... Again, if you were to have watched the actual entire video, you would see that actually the Tesla, and Omar explains it, was actually kind of avoiding the bicyclist and just giving room to the other side. I mean, you have to watch it to understand it. You can't see these little segments and clip them out and just show that and not understand the full context of what's happening. And they show that with a few other people. They show somebody who bought FSD beta back in, or uh, FSD package back in 2016, 2017, and they're all upset and butthurt by the fact that they don't have FSD yet. So on the one hand, they're criticizing that it's not there yet. On the other hand, he's pissed off that he doesn't have it yet. Look, man, you paid for a technology that doesn't exist yet. That's the whole point. You knew this. It's not, this isn't rocket science. It's like if I buy a house and I put my down payment on the house and it gets delayed by two years. Like I know what I signed up for. It's not built yet. I get it. Delays can happen. But with the house, I know a general construct of when it's going to happen because we have built houses before. Full self-driving has never been done before. So like, this isn't, I don't understand this complaint. It's ridiculous. So anyways, I could probably go on for another hour talking about this. This honestly, I think for people who follow Tesla, if they watch this, all the, all the BS is very apparent. It's very easy to sniff out. But for people who don't know much about Tesla and they don't follow this, I think for them, this is wrong. And I think this is something Tesla should not sit back on, right? This was very inappropriate. I think there's a lot of things out of context. And I think really this was just all about getting views and clicks and just trying to draw up some attention, right? Or there's somebody else behind this who's anti-Tesla and anti-FSD, right? I'd be very interesting to see who's funding this entire documentary hit piece. All right, well, those are my thoughts. I know this was a long video, but we had a lot to cover. Uh, right between the stock price, between the Business Insider article, and of course this documentary hit piece. Um, I, look, it's crazy times right now. Okay, crazy times. I'm happy that Tesla and Elon are finally staying up for themselves. Um, I don't think this is a matter of of if we had a PR team, we wouldn't have these issues. No, I think it's just a matter of going after people who are doing harm to the brand. So we'll see what happens moving forward. Um, look. Don't worry too much about next week. Enjoy your weekend. Um, you know, enjoy your family. Enjoy what we got going on. Uh, I appreciate if you stuck to the end. Again, I know this probably wasn't the most fun thing to watch, but you know, we got to cover these things and we got to try to be unbiased about it and see different points of view. So that's what I tried to do. Hopefully I did a decent job of it. Um, and again, if you guys haven't yet, do me a favor, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button, ring that bell. If you want to support the channel, you can find Patreon down below. In the description, you can find our merch store down below in the description as well. All right, well, with that said, I love you all. Enjoy your weekend. Peace.